on Business Incorporated today. Central African Republic becomes the first country in the world, the second country in the world, to adopt Bitcoin as a legal tender. Libya Oil Ministry plans to reopen closed fields in days. And Mozambique plans to create sovereign wealth fund for $96 billion gas oil this year. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Will Ibong. We kick off with markets as usual from Africa where mostly negative activities were seen at intraday. The NGX was trading low at intraday, down 0.76%. Same with South Africa's GSE index, which is down a massive 3.1%. Elsewhere on the continent, Egypt market index was in the green territory. At intraday, it gained almost 1%. For the Nairobi Stock Exchange in Kenya, it closed Friday's session negative down by 1.1%. Now to the Middle East, where it was mostly negative also. The Abu Dhabi index crossed still above the 10,000 level, but down 0.85%. Dubai's index was also down, trading 0.7% lower at intraday still within the middle east region the qatari index lost the 14,000 level but with a 0.09 percent marginal gain at intraday while saudi arabia's main index was the lone gainer at intraday within the region we track now to europe where france's pre presidential election has been decided many people in the region in europe appear to be feeling very relieved that emmanuel macron will remain france's leader for another five years now we have chris cober in berlin for more updates on that uh, chris so macron uh, comfortably defeated far-right rival marine le pen in the second round of france's presidential election winning 58.5 percent of the votes against 41.5 percent for le pen what have reactions been like for Macron's victory? There's been overwhelming relief uh, expressed by many world leaders over Macron's victory. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz said French voters have sent a strong vote of confidence uh, in Europe today. He was happy that uh, Germany and France could continue a good cooperation. We can count on France for five more years, European Council President Charles Michel wrote on Twitter, and U.S. President Joe Biden tweeted, I look forward to our continued close cooperation, including supporting Ukraine, defending democracy, and countering climate change. Now, there had been massive concerns that a Le Pen presidency would leave Europe rudderless following Brexit and the departure from politics of German Chancellor Angela Merkel. Also, Le Pen's past admiration for Russia's leader Vladimir Putin had left many EU and US officials feeling highly uneasy, fearing a Le Pen victory would divide the West in its front against Russia's aggression in Ukraine. Now, the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, wrote on Twitter that he appreciated Mr. Macron's support and that he was convinced the countries were moving together towards new common victories, as he put it. So with these concerns, uh, what will Macron be focusing on in his second term? Now, the situation now is similar to the one uh, in the presidential campaign, during which Emmanuel Macron had heavily been focusing on his role as a European leader, applying himself to trying to solve the crisis in Ukraine, and that will certainly remain on his agenda. Now, at the same time, many French people had the feeling their domestic needs hadn't been properly addressed uh, by the president. Two years of disruption from the pandemic and surge in energy exasperated uh, probably by the Ukraine war catapulted uh, economic issues to the forefront in the campaign. Now the rising cost of living has become an increasing strain for the poorest people in the country. Now these are some of the issues Macron will have to focus on, aiming to prove wrong 
many people's perception of him as an out-of-touch elitist. His pro-business policies had earned him fierce protests in many parts of the country. Now, during his victory speech on Sunday, Mr. Macron pledged what he called a renewed method to governing France, adding that this new era would not be one of continuity with the last term, which was ending now. So while we wait for the perceptions coming in, we're sure the markets will be reacting. What are the markets making of the election results? There's also been relief on markets over the victory of the pro-EU centrist Macron. Uh, a Le Pen presidency would certainly have sparked a, a much greater concern. Um, a second term for Emmanuel Macron is reassuring markets about France's commitment to an integrated Europe, even if his economic platform now depends on parliamentary elections, uh, which are to be held in June. There is some concern that this is a bittersweet victory for Emmanuel Macron, though. France's far right broke through the threshold of 40% of the vote, which is unprecedented. Also, voter turnout came in at the lowest level in over 50 years. And we have to keep in mind that the French presidency is limited to two terms. And with Emmanuel Macron now securing his final term, the question arises, who will follow him? With parties of the political center having pretty much imploded uh, in this election, with Macron's party mostly an empty vessel for himself, who will be there five years from now to stand up against Marine Le Pen who most likely will still be there. Now, apart from the results of the French presidential elections, investors have inflation on their minds, of course, and what they perceive as increasingly aggressive rhetoric by the U.S. Federal Reserve trying to combat rising prices. Uh, last week, Fed Chief Jerome Powell hinted that an interest rate hike in May could be bigger than expected and more could quickly follow. Asian markets declined this morning and European stocks took their cue from them. The DAX and Frankfurt under significant pressure, shedding around 1.5% and dropping below 14,000 points about an hour and a half into the trading session. Mm. We'll continue to track how markets react to this uh, over the week. Now we head to London where Juliana is standing by to give us updates on what's going on in the UK. Now, Juliana, you're in the House of Lords. Well, earlier in the day, you spoke with INI, the delegation from Nigeria's Ministry of Trade and Investment for the Economic Dialogue, had not arrived yet. Have they arrived now? And what activities are ongoing? Good afternoon, Will. Uh, before I go into a big uh, a splurge, can you hear me just to confirm that? Yes, Juliana, I can hear you loud and clear. <laughs> Okay, good afternoon. Yes, uh, so uh, the Minister of Trade and Investment, um, uh, Honourable Minister Otumba Ni Adebayo, has arrived uh, with uh, members of uh, the Ministry of Trade and Investment. Um, we are here at uh, the House of Lords, uh, where they've kicked off the UK-Nigeria uh, Trade Summit. There are actually two events uh, coinciding uh, this week. There's a huge delegation um, here uh, from um, Abuja, and it's really to make sure that they can kickstart uh, uh, some robust trade negotiations with the United Kingdom government. So first of all, today's uh, proceedings are being overseen uh, by a firm called Cater and Merger. Uh, they consist of uh, lots of um, uh, high-powered UK private sector individuals who are trying their utmost best to bring as much uh, trade volumes into uh, Nigeria. And this is all about numbers. We know that, of course, since uh, Britain left the European Union, they have really been trying to improve uh, their investment in Nigeria. I think Boris Johnson did say that he wants Britain to be uh, front and centre in bringing, being the investment hub for Nigerians. So that is part of the discussions that have taken place today. Now, tomorrow is where uh, kind of the meat starts. We have the seventh economic uh, dialogue forum. This is being co-hosted by uh, the Minister for Africa, um, uh, Vicky Ford, as well as uh, the Minister for Investment, Penny Mordaunt. Um, and we know that the Nigeria Ministry of Trade and Investment will be involved in that discussion 
earlier this morning and for the first time in quite a while because for some reason it's really difficult to try and get some really decent data um, about trade between Nigeria and the UK but it did come in this morning and it revealed uh, that in terms of volume Nigeria trade with the United Kingdom is just 0.3 percent of uh, UK trade volume so it's not enough I think we rank about 43 of all the countries in the world. And I think it's quite clear that more needs to be done. So we hope that tomorrow, when they do uh, release that communique, uh, that we'll be able to see which areas of investment they are going to excel in. But at the moment, it's been very, very quiet. Lots of pomp and ceremony today. But I think the real meet and the real decisions will take place tomorrow. And of course, uh, we'll be there live for you, Will. We'll definitely be watching out for that, Juliana. Tomorrow is going to be a big day, definitely. But I know you're out there in the House of Lords. Are you able to still track the markets? What are the markets looking at at intraday now? Absolutely. I've had a little helper uh, help me uh, with uh, the numbers. And um, I can say that the FTSE All Share started off the week in the red, unfortunately. It's currently down, down in triple digit figures by 1.95%. The FTSE 100, um, even worse, that's down by 2.15%. And the FTSE 250, that domestic market, Will, is down by one9 3%. In the currencies market, the British pound is currently trading down on the US dollar by 0.70%, also trading down uh, by the euro by 0.01%, and down on the Japanese yen by 0.88%. Uh, but uh, we have been doing lots of interviews, so we will be uh, putting all that uh, footage uh, to the viewers so you'll be able to see what's been taking place uh, during this uh, uh, trade investment uh, delegation trip to uh, the United Kingdom. Okay, Juliana, it's quite a fearful market numbers you reeled out there, but we'll keep track of what's happening and hope that, you know, positive de developments come up. Thank you, Will. Thank you so much, Juliana. Thank you so much for coming. Now, the president of the African Development Bank, AFDB, Dr. Akin Umi Adeshino, has advised Nigeria and other African countries that they must prepare for a global food crisis occasioned by the Russia-Ukraine war. The FDB has announced plans to spend over $1.5 billion to avert food crisis sparked by the Ukraine war. Adeshino said the war has worsened the woes of many Africans that resulted from the coronavirus pandemic and climate change. He also explained that Russia and Ukraine supply 30% of global wheat exports, the price of which has surged by almost 50% globally, reaching identical levels as during the 2008 global food crisis. Now to Asia, where mainland Chinese indexes led losses as Asia-Pacific markets fell sharply on Monday following a sell-off on Wall Street on Friday. The Shenzhen comp component tumbled 6.8%. 6.08%, while the Shanghai Composite declined 5.13%. Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index fell 3.57% in late trade as the Hang Seng Tech Index dropped 4.43%. Shares of Chinese video company Bilibili plunged 5.24% in Hong Kong, and Alibaba's Hong Kong-listed shares slipped 4.96%. Japan's Nikkei 225 slipped 1.9%, while the topics declined 1.5%. In Korea, the Kospi slid 1.76% and the Kozak was down 2.49%. Australia and New Zealand markets are closed on Monday for a holiday. Now in the U.S., stock futures fell on Monday amid a four-week losing streak for the Dow Jones industrial average as investors weighed the likelihood of rising interest rates. Wall Street is also bracing for stacked weeks of earnings, including reports from major tech companies such as Amazon and Apple. Dow Jones Industrial Average Futures, 0.8% so uh, down. Uh, S&P 500 Futures dipped 1.05%, and Nasdaq 100 Futures declined 1.23%. Those moves come after Friday's sell-off, with the Dow dropping 2.8% in what was the Dow's worst day since October 2020. The S&P 500 fell 2.8%, or its worst day since March, and the Nasdaq Composite dropped by 2.6%. All the major averages closed down lower last week, with the Dow falling 1.9% for the week, or its fourth street weekly decline. The S&P 500 and the Nasdaq dropped 2.8% and 3.8% for the week, respectively, posting their third street weekly decline. We'll take a break now, and when we come back, a quick look. Uh, more stories will be coming from the African continent, and that's in a moment. Do stay with us. Welcome back. 
Ghana's economy has developed at the quickest rate in two years. Uh, the country posted a better than expected final quarter gross domestic product growth of 5.4%, beating government and international monetary funds forecast. To help us make sense of this, we have international financial analyst Okpe Olua Dakwa Thomas to talk to us. Hi, Dakwa, good to have you. Hi, thank you. Uh, Ghana's GDP recorded a 5.4% improvement uh, over the, you know, in the last quarter of uh, 2021. What do you think of this growth? Oh, well, it's um, quite um, impressive. I mean, analysts had it as 5.1%. I mean, we knew the economy was going to grow, but I mean, to this level was very, very encouraging, especially when you look at um, other countries. So relatively, Nigeria economic um, GDP grew by 3.4%. So Ghana 5.4% is very, very impressive. Um, we also need to acknowledge that this is a sharp rebound from the lows of the COVID pandemic. And um, the target is to return to pre-pandemic level. So that's what they're actually looking at. But 5.4% is very encouraging. And uh, I remember in 2020, it was 0 0.4 percent so in 2021 having it at 5.4 percent shows that they are um, what do you call it going on to a higher um, economic growth so what do you think contributed what are the factors that led to this growth what are the contributing factors oh, well so we have to analyze it i mean like I said, in 2020, it was 0.4%. So what happened that year was a pandemic. So going back, going to 5.4% means that all the things that the pandemic held down had improved. And there are two sectors where, that basically were responsible for this growth, the agricultural sector and the services sector. We need to know that the services sector, um, what do you call it? It's, uh, it's, it's basically half of the GDP of um, Ghana. I mean, we look at things like trade, hotels and restaurants, transport and storage, information and communication, um, financial and insurance activities, real estate. So these are the sectors that picked up last year um, compared to 2020 when there were when there were lockdowns and uh, there were short um, supply chain issues. Also, agriculture as well. You can now sell, you can now move things from different places. So crops, cocoa, livestock, forestry, logging, fishing, um, all these activities picked up as well. So these were the two major contributing factors to um, the economic growth of Ghana. Uh, analysts are thinking that, uh, of the opinion that we will see a decline in the first quarter of um, 2022. Do you think that's going to happen? Anything that the results are going to be posted will be negative or not as great as what we saw in Q4? Um, well, it's... it's the only reason that's going to stop it, obviously, is what we're having in um, Europe. I mean, like um, the world is interwoven, so there are so many um, transactions that are going on. But the truth is, uh, we're expecting it to grow higher because in, in quarter three, 2021, uh, GDP was around 9.9%. So we're having a larger, a higher forecast for 2022, which is higher than what we got in 2021. Um, and analysts are looking at it to grow up to 6.8%. So um, unless things change, um, what do you call it, in the whole global economy, and especially with um, other things that contributing to um, low, uh, more like what it forecasts. I mean, we're looking at people bringing up um, intra increasing interest rates and that might slow down economic activity. But if it doesn't slow down activity, um, economic activity, things can continue to pick up at this level. Do you think it's linked to the high inflation that's been experienced globally, as you mentioned, you know, we've seen factors of high inflation, supply disruptions all around the world. Do you think this uh, sentiments are being linked to high inflation? Oh, well, uh, two, two of them are distinct, um, what do I call it, economic terms. So inflation, obviously, is the increase in the cost of um, goods and services, while GDP is the, in, um, what do you call it, the increase in the monetary value of goods and services passed around the nation. So you can um, see that as a very good, a healthy in indicator. So the higher the GDP, the healthier the economy, but the higher the infl inflation rates, the, I mean, Technically, I wouldn't say the more terrible the economy is, but it's not a good sign for the economy. So uh, Ghana's inflation percent is around 19.4%, which is very high. It's higher than what we have here in Nigeria, it's 15.6% thereabout. So it's uh, the GDP, yes, is showing that economic activity is going on, but at this going on at a price and at a cost, and uh, with inflation rates going up higher, they need to find a way to address um, the inflation rate without actually affecting GDP. So that's why you might see a different economical imbalance of the growth of, of both um, contributing um, indicators. So it's, it's, but it's very, very good for Ghana economy overall. Like I said, compared with other African countries, it's very decent. And um, the services sector has picked up and uh, it's going to show what you call it's more room for improvement and foreign direct investment will come I mean, foreign investors are going to look at, look at it and say, okay, yes, I think it's safe to come back to this economy. And I mean, 
we're not expecting another lockdown, although there's are issues, obviously, in China, where you see there are lockdowns and then people are still saying COVID is out there, but withstanding or not having that um, um, lockdown again will ensure that um, the economy keeps growing. We hope things get better from here. Thank you so much, uh, Paulua Dapo Thomas, International Financial Analyst, for joining us today. Thank you very much. Now, the Central African Republic has become the first country in Africa and the second in the world after El Salvador to make Bitcoin a national currency, according to the Minister of Digital Economy and Telecommunications and the Minister of Finance and Budget, who drafted the bill and framework for cryptocurrency regulation. Bitcoin will be accepted as payment throughout the country, along with Central African Republic's national currency, the Central African CFO. The country has long been suffering from poverty, poor human rights and civil war and the adoption of Bitcoin could help the country to work towards economic recovery and transform its digital infrastructure. Now, Libya's oil ministry says oil fields shut down by protesters may reopen within days. This move potential, potentially allows the OPEC member to get back to full production. The ministry will met with tribal leaders, says the closure has been Libya's, has caused Libya's daily output to fall by around 500,000 barrels from 1.3 million in the past 10 days. It adds that the leaders are in the process of reaching a final agreement that would put an end to the closures. The shutdowns are the latest in a series of disruptions to hit Libya's energy sector this year as political tensions mount. Protests calling for Prime Minister Abdul Hamid Jadeba to quit have engulfed many major oil facilities. Libya's biggest field, Sharara, and the nearby El Fil deposit a boat shut at the moment. Mozambique plans to establish a sovereign wealth fund later this year as it prepares to start natural gas exports, a move the government says may generate $96 billion in revenue for the country. According to the country's finance minister, the authorities are in process of finalizing draft legislation that will govern the management of the fund. He also expects the fund to be operational before some Mozambique's first liquefied natural gas exports begin flowing by October. Soaring natural gas prices have presented Mozambique with an opportunity to fast track the development of its resources and also to ensure that it can provide to the world an alternative source of supply of energy products. Now, Zimbabwean President Emerson Nangangwa says banks and companies involved in local currency manipulation and unjustifiable increases in the prices of goods and services could lose their operating licenses. The president adds that his administration is devising methods to deal with the banks and companies with plans to be announced soon. According to the president, these actions causes a challenge to the economy, especially around prices and exchange rates. Now, oil prices have slumped to a two-week low on Monday, extending last week's decline as concern grew that prolonged COVID-19 lockdowns in Shanghai and potential increases to U.S. interest rates would hurt global economic growth and oil demand. Brent crude was down 4.3% and touched $101.94 earlier in the session, the lowest since April the 12th. U.S. West Texas intermediate crude fell 4% to $97.96. Both oil Benchmark lost uh, nearly 5% last week on demand concerns, and Brent has retreated sharply after eating $139, the highest since 2008. Oil gained support from tight supply. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has already reduced supply because of Western sanctions and customers avoiding buying Russian oil. But the markets could tighten further with a potential EU ban on Russian crude. Outages in Libya are also lending support. The OPEC member is losing more than 550,000 barrels per day in production because of unrest, with the Zawiya oil refinery suffering damage after armed clashes. Now, gold prices slipped to their lowest in four weeks on Monday as prospects of aggressive policy tightening by the U.S. Federal Reserve and a stronger, stronger dollar dented the precious metals appeal. Spot gold fell by 0.7% earlier, hitting its lowest since March 29th, while U.S. gold futures were down 0.9%. Silver fell 0.2% to $23.65 per ounce after eating an over two-month throw. And that's it on the program for today. I'm Will Lebong. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.